Hello, and welcome to today's Data Byte, where we're going to talk about describe visual patterns. So we'll think about some common data patterns. We'll talk about sort of where perception science meets us finding and visualizing these patterns, and then a few other things to think about. So when we're thinking about data literacy, this visualizing or describing the visual pattern really comes into play with the analyze and interpret part of being data literate. So just to start off, you can pause the video and take a look at these two different graphs. These are from a data classroom activity, but really you could fill in any graph. So what patterns do you see across these graphs? Understand, I know full well that you have no idea what these data are about, but what patterns do you see in the data? What patterns may your learners see in these data? So you can choose these two graphs or you can choose these two graphs, and these are from a gizmo simulation. So which either one you prefer, stop the video, take a few seconds and think about this. Like, what do you see and what may your learner see in terms of the patterns in the data? So the describing the visual pattern or describe and analyze patterns is part of our exploring the data in terms of the functions that fall under the explore data. And that's different than interpret data to learn something. So that's why I was saying you don't need to know anything about the data to be able to think about what patterns do you see in the data. And there's a whole host of information as to like what actually goes into describing and analyzing patterns that you can check out on the building blocks for data literacy, where we break it down by different grade level. Well, the four major components that go into it are we're recognizing and describing the variability. We're sort of describing that visual pattern. This is the big piece that we are working on that we're sort of thinking about here, as well as do the like doing things right because it's part of the exploring data realm doing things to reveal or highlight the pattern and then especially as we get older and farther along we're modeling or we're quantifying that pattern so we're going to focus in on sort of what does it take to describe the visual pattern of things so part of that is understanding what it is we even mean when we're talking about a pattern. And there are five common patterns that we see when we're looking at data. Sure, this is not exhaustive, but there are five common ones. So one is that it is stable. This is this is one we often forget that this is the reality um, in science. But so here what we're looking at, right, this is not necessarily a science example, um, but we use data across all of our subject areas. So here we're looking at a time series from the 1998 to 2019. And this is the average rating of different DreamWorks movies. Right. So we could look at these data and the average rating has been pretty remarkably consistent or stable across time for DreamWorks. And so this is one of a, pa of a pattern that we see, one that I should say our students really do not often like. Another common pattern that we see is that something is increasing or ascending, or we'll say it has a positive relationship. So here's an example where we're looking at the mass of an M&M as it relates to the diameter of the M&M. And what we have actually is we have three different types of M&Ms. So we have plain M&Ms, peanut butter M&Ms, and peanut M&Ms. And what we can see, what I've superimposed onto these data is their line of fit. And for all three of these, as mass increases, the diameter increases as well. And so for all three of these M&M types, there is an increasing pattern that we're seeing. Now, what's tricky for students sometimes is that, you know, especially with this peanut type M&M, those data points are getting pretty far away from that line, from that positive trend line, or even these plain M&Ms. It can be pretty hard to see that, like, that's not just a ball, that there actually is some directionality into those points. That gets at another part of a pattern, which we'll talk about at the end of this data byte. Another common pattern is decreasing or descending or negative, right? And that's when um, sort of helping our kids realize that that means as one increases, so as pressure increases, the other decreases, the altitude decreases, or usually the more typical way that we talk about this is as altitude increases, the pressure decreases. Uh, this is from data from a weather balloon. Um, 
Another pattern, another common pattern that we see with data is that it is variable, that there is no discernible direction to the data. Um, so here we're looking at the latest fossil age and the weight of dinosaurs that were found. And when we look at these two, it does not seem to be any directionality. It's not increasing, it's not decreasing, it doesn't like, maybe it's sort of stable hard there. It's kind of hard to tell, like it's just sort of all over the place, which gives us an indication that Either there is no strong relationship between the two variables that we're looking at in this case, or we don't have enough data. And then finally, the fifth common pattern that we see is something that is cyclical. This is often called seasonal, but we can get cyclical patterns without it actually being related to a season of the year. So I think cyclical is a better way to talk about this, where there's a common periodicity to the ups and downs of the data. Now, this is this is a great example as well of the finches over the year, because not only do we have a cyclical pattern, but we also have a component of the data where we're increasing and another component of the data where overall we're decreasing, which brings me to the point of we need to like our students need to be able to identify these five common patterns so that when they're looking at data, they can sort of get used to this pattern recognition. We are pattern recognition beings. And so learning the pattern can help us as we go through. But then also as they're advancing in their comfort, realize that multiple patterns of these can show up in one data set. And so it's not just a one and done, oh, this is increasing, but it's like, oh, well, this seems to be cyclical and at times increasing and at times decreasing overall. And that sort of that next step nuance that really helps with the interpretation and the making sense of what's going on with the data. So giving our students the language to talk through all five of these different common patterns, as well as the practice and the repetition of seeing different iterations of these patterns can help build their skills of being able to describe the visual pattern. If we think about it, it's really similar to learning the ABCs, right? We first learn how, many of us first learn how to sing the song, but we have no idea how the words we are saying or the sounds that we are hearing relate to the actual shape of the letters. And then we have to learn that, right? That's the next step is like learning, okay, what is the visual shape of the letter that I'm looking at? This is oftentimes when kids who are just learning the patterns, the shape of the letters will mix up W and M, or they'll mix up N and Z because they haven't yet learned the orientation, the consistent orientation of the shapes. So we gotta get the sort of base level of like, what is the general shape that I'm looking at? So then I have the vocabulary to use as well as the visual training of my eyes of the pattern to use to talk about the pattern in the data that we're doing. So that's step one. It's like, what are our common patterns and how do we help build our skill, our students' abilities to talk about and recognize visually those? But what I do want to talk about it as well is that there's a lot else that goes on when we are describing the visual pattern and things, and it has to do with how our eyes work. We, as I said, are pattern recon recognizing beings. We love to recognize patterns. For some of us, some patterns come more easily than others. There's lots of fun things out there where you can see sort of how your eyes can play tricks on you. Some of us see this image and we only see the bunny's head. Some of us look at this image and we only see a duck head. And some of us look at this image and have no idea what I'm talking about. So while we love patterns and we are constantly seeking patterns in our environment, some of them are harder or easier to see. So this is another fun one where this middle gray bar is actually all the same color of gray, but it is the comparison to the background that enables a lot of us to perceive this side of the gray bar to be a lighter versus this side to be a darker gray. So there's a lot that goes into a pattern that's baked into a pattern. I also want to uh, share that research indicates that as humans, there are some patterns that we are 
better at observing more quickly. So this is once you have a sense of those five common patterns of what's going on, you have the vocabulary, even with all of that, there are just some that our eyes and our brains are more cued in to being able to quickly discern from the data that we're looking at than others. So as in no amount of teaching can teach us out of this. This is sort of innate in how our brains and our eyes work. So what are some things we're really good at? Well, we are really good at seeing a positive relationship or and said another way, as one thing increases, the other increases. We see that easily and very quickly. It takes us an extra beat to see a pattern that is negative or decreasing as one increases, the other decreases. That sort of that inverse relationship between the two variables. So it can have the same, we can have the same confidence, it can have the same tightness of the pattern and it's just going to take us an extra moment visually to take it in and see it if it is negative versus positive and then there's some that we're just really bad at and so those are things that we need to practice even more to be able to see if they are things that we we anticipate we're going to see or if these are patterns that are coming up a lot in the curriculum that we're using, we just need to recognize as the facilitators of the learning that it's going to take a few extra moments for our learners to make sense of what's going on within that pattern. And then there's another layer. So Gestalt principles were put out by a group of psychologists in Germany in the late 19th, earliest 20th century, where they were looking at how is it for those of us that are visually able and who are receiving thousands of visual stimulus and every moment of every day, basically how do our brains not explode? How do we make sense of this information? Well, the answer comes down to patterns. We recognize patterns in our world and we ascribe meanings or groupings to the visual information that we are taking in so that we can kind of compartmentalize it or that we can kind of make some initial split second reasoning without any knowledge of what it is that we're actually taking into account. And these are eight of the common gestalt principles that show up a lot when we're working with data. I'm not going to talk to uh, through them in too much detail now if you're interested in what each of these eight are and how they work I encourage you to join the data literacy series section and we can talk about it more but just sort of quickly i'll give you an example is with proximity many of us see a group of nine dots here is a square a group of three dots is a triangle and another group of three dots is a triangle as opposed to 15 dots overall in this space our eyes sort of group these dots that are closer to one another into different groups we know they're all yellow we know they're all in the same space but kind of initially in the split second we group them into different places and this is at play when we are describing the visual patterns in our data so this was a graph put out by the new york times back in the summer of 2021 where what we're looking at is we've got some blue lines up here which the annotations tell us are from 2017 2018 and 2019 and then we have a red line that drops way down here and again the annotation tells us it's from 2021 so before i even explained what these data were about oh sorry these are the spin of major league fastballs right i hadn't even gotten there i can pretty much guarantee that your eye before i even traced it with my mouse it jumped out that that red line was different part of that is the continuity principle of it's sort of this cascading down it is dropping away from these other lines these lines are connected so we our eye sort of follows that connection we presume that this red dot is similar or has some grouping or meaning to this red dot because they are physically connected and so i share this to share how our eyes are making sense of visual stimulus as it's coming in plays into how we make sense of visual patterns in data when we're looking at them. Oftentimes, this can work to our advantage, and I'm going to share in a moment how we can make this work to our advantage even more when we're helping our learners make sense of data. I do just want to provide one moment of caution that sometimes this can work against us. So this is an example of a graph that was put out in 2014 by Reuters, and the what 
a lot of research has been done on this graph and the way many people interpret this graph is that they read the annotation that in 2005 Florida enacted the stand your ground law and the line goes down and so they interpret this to mean the law went in and then there was a decrease in the number of deaths unfortunately the y-axis is flipped and we, just like our students, often do not look at the y-axis when we're looking at a graph. And so if you actually orient this graph the way that we're more used to making sense of it, so that the y-axis is increasing, what we can see is that it doesn't mean the deaths went down, it means there was an actually an increase. But we see down and we think down is good in this context because of that continuity principle. And we and because these points are connected, we as attribute that there's meaning to the to that sequence of those dots okay so that's just my like the gestalt principles are working no matter what sometimes to our advantage and sometimes they can send us astray because right the whole point of the gestalt principles is that we are split second subconsciously making decisions we are putting grouping visual stimulus that is coming to us into these patterns into these groupings so how can we leverage this to our advantage? Well, here are some data from an in-class experiment where students were looking at like how much material, like what's the mass of material when you add water to different sponges, to a natural sponge versus a synthetic sponge. This is often how our students look at these data. Oh, we just sort of take an average and we plot the bar chart. Oh, but then it gets hard to think about like, okay, so then we're just thinking like, are these different? Is 40 that much different than 45.3? Should we even be talking about 0.3, right? That in and of itself is a data scale. But when we're talking about kind of making sense of the data and visualizing the pattern, this is an example where it can be really helpful to not just plot the average, but to plot all of the data. What have we done here? Well, we've taken it, so we're not just looking at the continuity of the difference of two bars, but we're now also getting proximity at play. We're like kicking in the proximity principle for our learners eyes to look at of like, oh, all these points are like super clumped together. These are a little bit far apart, but still really clumped together. And then we have the sort of the figure ground of like the bars in the back and the dots are on the front. We're just layering in different gestalt principles, different ways our eyes are naturally working to make sense of what's going on. We could take it a next step further and we could put a circle around those dots to really give us a visual cue of where are the data to help us make a determination of are these different? Is the amount of mass of a natural wet sponge really different than the amount of mass of a synthetic sponge? So what we've done here is we've gone from just using one of the gestalt principles to layering in multiple gestalt principles as our students are looking at the data to give them more visual cues for their brain to pick up on as they're making sense of it. Okay, let's look at one more. So here's an example. Oftentimes we will give students a graph like this, probably not this exact graph, right? Um, but we'll say like, here's a graph. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Or make a claim, what's going on in these data? Um, but what we can do is we can add some of these just all principles, again, to like give the visual cues as our novices are learning how to make sense of data. So we can enclose all the dots. We can bisect it and cut it into two parts where we've now connected it together. And so rather than just giving kind of here are the dots, we can do it or even better, we can have them do it, add these visual cues onto the graph. And what that does is it sort of one that eye hand um, important part of learning that we all know, like when we're actually doing something with our hand, it activates a different part of our brain. And therefore we have to be actively thinking about what's going on. And it gives our eyes that extra visual cue of more information to take in as they're trying to identify the pattern that's going on. So we have got our five common patterns. We've got the reality of like, how our eyes take in visual information. There is so much more that can go into describing the visual patterns. I have just a few final thoughts for you to consider. 
One of which is that we talk about patterns differently depending on what subject area we're in. So the five common patterns that we talked about today are common ways that we talk about patterns in our science classes, but our students will be walking into other classrooms like their math classroom, and they will be asked to be talking about the patterns in the data in a different way. Obviously, this is dependent upon what, well, what age level the students are at, well, but just a note of like how we talk, how, what words we're using and how we're asking our learners to talk about the pattern in the data, the visual pattern in the data depends on what our subject area discipline is looking for in terms of what we want students to do with those data. So the more explicit and the more sort of concrete examples and graphic organizers and visual examples we can give our learners, the better for them to be able to make sense of when they need to apply what what discussion of patterns into our different classes. Another thing that I want to leave you with is that when we talk about patterns in science, be it the natural sciences or the social sciences, when we have numeric data, especially that we're working with, there are three components of any pattern. There's the direction, there's the magnitude, and then there's our confidence in the pattern. So another way that we talk about patterns is how strong or is it weak or that there's no pattern whatsoever within the data. Now, again, if you want to talk more about this, let me know. We're trying to keep these data bytes pretty small, but just wanted to layer that in of like, there's more than just the direction that we care about when we're looking at data because that gives us an indication of how we answer our question and how confident we are that our data indicate, give us enough information to answer our question and or that we're looking at the right part of the phenomenon to be able to figure out what's going on. The last thing that I want to leave you with is that a stable pattern where nothing's changing, where like one variable, while one variable changes, the other doesn't change something that is variable, like as one changes, the other changes, but they don't seem to change it all in relation to one another, as well as if it's weak or if there's no pattern, are legitimate patterns. And these are patterns we do not often give our learners opportunities to look at or make sense of, and that is to their detriment. Because when they go into the real world or when they're looking at their own real world data from an investigation and they see this, they freak out and are convinced that they've done something wrong. When really it might be, no, they just need to change the variable. They just don't have the right variable for the question that they're asking. That's, so therefore they've got a new question and they can dig into it further and explore it more. So what are some opportunities to expand the kind of patterns that we're, that we're having our learners look at while we're building their data literacy? So I encourage you to stop the video again. Here are two um, reflection questions that I pose to you in terms of sort of thinking about this quick data bite about describing the visual patterns in terms of what strategies could you use to help your learners describe the patterns, maybe that are a bit differently or, um, or totally different than what you have been doing based on this data bite, or are there any additional supports that might help you or your learners better describe the patterns in the data. If you have some examples of those, feel free to leave them in a comment or send them to me directly. Uh, here's my email. I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, please reach out with any questions or requests you have about this topic or other data topics. This is an example of my electricity bill from May 2019. And because I could visually look at these data and look at what was going on, I could notice that May 2019 was really different than May 2018. And I could see that something was slightly off on the pattern and save myself some money. So I hope this data bite was helpful in terms of breaking down a few extra things or a few different um, aspects of what it takes to describe visual patterns. I look forward to hearing from you and have fun with the data. Thanks.